Hi, this is Michael Autos, and we are continuing our discussion of renal physiology. This is recording part six. Now we're going to talk about some clinical conditions. The first is acute kidney injury, also called acute renal failure. When we talk about acute kidney injury, we can categorize it, categorize it into pre-renal, renal, or post-renal. Pre-renal means that something has happened prior to the kidneys, usually involving decreased blood supply. So if renal blood flow is decreased and GFR and sodium filtration are decreased, then there's less need for sodium reabsorption, and that's the main process that consumes oxygen in the kidney cells, and so your kidney has a decreased renal oxygen requirement. And this results in oliguria, which is diminished urine output. Acute kidney injury is reversible if you can restore adequate blood flow before ischemic damage occurs. The most common causes of acute kidney injury would be intravascular volume depletion due to hemorrhage or diarrhea, vomiting or burns, decreased cardiac output as you might see with a myocardial infarction or valvular damage, significant peripheral vasodilation, you might see that in hypotension due to anaphylaxis or anesthesia or sepsis and damage to the vessels that feed the artery, the renal uh, arteries, like renal artery stenosis or embolism or thrombosis. So that was pre-renal. Then we have intrarenal etiologies, abnormalities within the kidney itself. You can have glomerular problems like vasculitis or cholesterol emboli. Severe malignant hypertension can damage the glomerulus. Patients can develop a glomerulonephritis, which occurs one to three weeks after an infection, usually some sort of group A beta, uh, group A beta strep infection. In these cases, antibodies react with the strep antigen and they form an immune complex that gets stuck in the glomerulus, leading to inflammation and renal shutdown. Usually it subsides after a couple weeks and patients may return to normal renal function. You can also have intrarenal abnormalities in the renal tubules, leading to necrosis, cell damage, and plugged renal tubules. This can occur due to ischemia or toxins. The renal interstitium can also be injured from acute pyelonephritis or interstitial nephritis. Finally, we have post-renal etiologies. This occurs when there's obstruction of the urinary collecting system. So this might happen if the ureters are both obstructed by stones or clots, or if the bladder becomes obstructed, or some sort of urethral obstruction or Foley catheter obstruction. When a patient has acute kidney injury, they retain water and metabolic waste products and electrolytes. They can develop edema and hypertension, hyperkalemia and acidosis, and if they become aneuric, which means they're not making any urine at all, they can die within a period of a couple weeks unless their renal function is restored or some replacement therapy like dialysis is initiated. Now that's acute kidney injury. We can also talk about chronic kidney disease. These are people who have lost about three quarters of their nephrons and the loss is irreversible. There are many different causes of chronic kidney disease. Metabolic disorders like diabetes, obesity and amyloid, hypertension, renal vascular disorders like atherosclerosis and nephrosclerosis, immune disorders, infections, nephrotoxins, again post-renal obstructions, and congenital disorders. Now as the number of remaining functioning nephrons decreases, the remaining nephrons have to work harder. As that happens, renal tubular flow becomes more rapid. And as flow becomes more rapid through the renal tubule, you can still produce urine, but it's very hard to concentrate the urine sufficiently. So we start getting more dilute urine. This eventually leads to end-stage renal disease, which is complete loss of kidney function to the point where you need dialysis or transplantation in order to serve all of the functions that the kidney normally does. The most common causes of end-stage renal disease in this country are diabetes and hypertension. Now, chronic kidney disease patients will have edema because they're retaining salt and water. They can become acidotic. They may have a high nitrogen concentration because remember all those substances that the kidney excretes like urea, creatinine, and uric acid. 
high urea levels can actually lead to uremic platelet dysfunction as well. And other substances like phenols, sulfates, phosphates, potassium, guanidine, they will all start to build up as the kidneys get sicker and sicker. Remember the other functions of the kidney. If the kidney becomes diseased, it may not produce erythropoietin and patients will develop anemia. Osteomalacia occurs as renal production of vitamin D starts to fail. These patients will retain phosphate, and since phosphate binds to plasma calcium, which leads to more PTH secretion, parathyroid hormone, the bones will start to be demineralized in an attempt to increase plasma calcium levels. Patients with chronic kidney disease are very likely to have hypertension. We said it's a common cause of kidney disease, but unfortunately it's also an effect. As they lose their ability to excrete water and sodium, they become hypertensive. Furthermore, renal damage and ischemia leads to renin secretion, which leads to more angiotensin II, which leads to more hypertension. Now, renal replacement therapy, or dialysis, has a few clear indications, and you can remember them with the mnemonic AEIOU. A is for acidosis. E is for electrolyte disturbances, commonly sodium, potassium, or calcium. I is for intoxicants or toxins. Those would include methanol, ethylene glycol, lithium, aspirin, and other drugs and toxins. O is for overload, as in volume overload. And U is for the symptoms of uremia, which include nausea, seizures, pericarditis, and bleeding from platelet dysfunction. I just wanted to review a couple basic concepts about hemodialysis for you. Hemodialysis involves taking blood out of the patient, passing it over a membrane which has dialyzing fluid on the other side, and this transfers waste products across the membrane. The nephrologist can adjust the composition of that dialyzing fluid in order to cause appropriate movement of water as well as solutes and toxins. And this is usually done four to six hours a day, three days a week. The blood is removed from the body and then returned through a few different mechanisms. Patients may have a fistula. A fistula is a direct surgical connection between an artery and a vein, usually in an arm or a leg. After this artificial connection is created straight from the artery to the vein, it needs time to mature. So these can't be used immediately after surgery. They have to wait for a couple months usually. Patients may also have a graft, which is some tubing implanted either from the artery to the vein or a loop that can be put between the artery and the vein. And these can be used immediately after surgery. Two needles are placed, one for withdrawing the blood, the other for putting it back in. Patients may also have an external dialysis catheter, which is like a central line. Usually it just is in the vein. And these can also be used immediately after placement. Another kind of dialysis is called peritoneal dialysis. These patients have an anchored plastic catheter, sort of like a spout, that's placed in their peritoneal cavity. Then a dialysate fluid can be infused into their abdominal cavity and remain in there for several hours. The solute just diffuses across the peritoneal membrane and then fresh fluid can be exchanged for the old fluid. Some patients undergo automated peritoneal dialysis where they have a, me a mechanized cycler that continuously infuses and drains the dialysate all night long while the patient is sleeping. Peritoneal dialysis is well suited for patients who uh, may not be able to tolerate the rapid fluid shifts that you see in hemodialysis and the blood pressure fluctuations. Or some patients may have difficulty with creation of a vascular access site. On the other hand, peritoneal dialysis carries a risk of developing infection in the peritoneal cavity, which is called peritonitis. And this can be life-threatening, presenting as abdom abdominal pain and fever. What considerations are important when doing anesthesia for patients who have chronic kidney disease? First, we can use their serum creatinine level to determine if their renal function is stable.
we need to consider coexisting diseases like diabetes and hypertension. Should we measure potassium levels in the preoperative area? You will find that most patients who are on renal replacement therapy or have very severe kidney disease will have their serum potassium checked on the day of surgery, and at most centers it's actually a policy. There is a little bit of data suggesting that routine serum potassium measurement is not necessary unless there's been a recent change in dialysis or medication or an acute illness. However, most centers will be routinely checking potassium prior to anesthesia in patients who have end-stage renal disease. Remember that the hyperkalemic response to succinylcholine is not exaggerated in these patients. Patients with chronic kidney disease are likely to have pre-existing anemia and may also have uremic platelet dysfunction, which could be treated with desmopressin if needed. Consider renal dosing of any drugs that depend significantly on renal elimination. Patients may have attenuated sympathetic activity, which would lead to impaired vasoconstriction. We would therefore see a hypotensive response to hypovolemia, positive pressure ventilation, position changes, or drug-induced myocardial depression. In patients who have end-stage renal disease, you want to avoid placing a blood pressure cuff or an IV or arterial line in the extremity that has their dialysis access. We want to ask the patient about their most recent dialysis, when it was and if there were any deviations from their normal schedule. We can estimate a patient's blood volume status by comparing their current weight with their calculated dry weight, which is their target weight right after dialysis. And most patients know what their dry weight is supposed to be. Patients who have recently dialyzed may respond to anesthetic drugs as though they were hypovolemic. We need to pay careful attention to the fistula or graft thrill throughout surgery and alert the proper team immediately if we detect that there's no longer flow through their dialysis access. <clears throat> Which IV fluids should we use in renal patients? Well, we have to balance. On one hand, we don't want to give them excess potassium since they can't excrete it through their kidneys. But on the other hand, sodium chloride increases their risk of acidosis. So there are actually benefits to each of those two common fluids, lactated ringers and sodium chloride. A fluid bolus may be helpful in a patient who is recently dialyzed, but of course we want to minimize excessive IV fluid in all dialysis patients. We may have a lower threshold to place an intraarterial or a central venous pressure catheter in order to better monitor the patient's hemodynamics. That's it for this section. Please let me know at any time if you have questions about the material.